All right, so Physics 252, this is Chapter 22, Lecture Part 2. I said I was going to take a look at this example, um, kind of work through it with you or for you. Uh, definitely you should have given it a look, but uh, we'll walk through it together. And then we're going to finish Chapter 22 in this video. So um, here's the situation. You have a non-uniformly charged sphere. Uh, which has a uh, volume charge density. This character here is a rho, lowercase Greek letter rho. Um, what does that mean? It just means that the, uh, for that given charge density function, it means the charge uh, density increases uh, with the square of the radius. What does that look like? Um, well, I'll zoom in in a second, but it just means that more, much more of the charge is concentrated near the outer part of the sphere. So they want you to find alpha in terms of the total charge Q on the sphere and its radius R0 uh, and then find the electric field as a function of R inside the sphere. We know what the electric field outside the sphere is. It's just, you know, KQ over epsilon naught. I'm sorry, KQ over R squared. Uh, because if we draw a Gaussian surface outside this sphere, doesn't matter what the charge density function is. Um, the total charge inside a Gaussian sphere that includes the charge is just still Q, okay? So let me zoom this in. Okay, uh, so here we go, charge density. Uh, don't worry about this stuff, That's leave that for, for later. Um, charge density function is given as this, okay? Um, again, this is what it kind of looks like. Most of the charge is concentrated into the outer part of the sphere. Uh, in red, this is a variable R. This is a fixed, this is the fixed constant uh, radius of the sphere. Okay, so here's our Gauss's law, all right? Um, we know that by spherical symmetry, the uh, left-hand side, the flux part of Gauss's law, gives just the electric field times the uh, surface of the Gaussian sphere. Again, Gaussian sphere, just like a soap bubble that you imagine, scooping out some charge, but the question is how much charge does a, a soap bubble scoop out uh, if it's inside this sphere? It's non-conducting, so this the uh, charge is distributed in a non-constant kind of way. Okay, so um, enclosed charge is the tricky part here for this problem. Um, to, to find the enclosed charge, we have, to, we have to integrate the volume charge density, charge per unit volume, which is now not a constant, it's a function. Uh, over a, a bit of volume, right? Um, and then add all those bits up from over the full integral of the volume. Now, uh, it, <coughs> in the, the book, they kind of give you a little help. Uh, this tiny, this, this red circle can be viewed as, as a tiny spherical shell of a certain volume. What's the volume of a very, very thin spherical shell? Uh, well, it's just the surface area of that shell times the thickness of the shell, dr. Okay, that gives you, that gives you a volume, right? Just like anything, any volume, uh, the surface of it times the thickness is the volume. So uh, our surface, our volume charge density rho, a r alpha r squared comes in here. So I have alpha 4 pi r to the fourth. Uh, performing the integral gives us 4 pi alpha r to the fifth over 5. Okay. They want us to write alpha in terms of the total charge. The total charge must be, must be, the volume charge density integrated over the entire sphere from zero to the full out, outer radius. So same integral, but with the new limit, instead of a variable limit, it's a fixed limit, uh, gives us the alpha that we want. Five total charge, I call it QT, and the problem is just Q, but I, I, I refer to it as Q total. Um, Alpha is 5 Q total divided by 4 pi R naught, which is again the fixed, R sub zero is the fixed radius to the fifth. Um, so if we take this alpha, plug it in there, we find that the enclosed charge is total charge QT, uh, the, the enclosed charge for any given radius at any Gaussian sphere of a radius R is total charge QT times uh, that variable radius R to the fifth over the fixed full radius of the sphere R zero, R sub zero to the fifth. Okay, so that comes up here, Q enclosed. Uh, we plug it in, uh, the four pi R squared comes down underneath, and we get our expression for the electric field. So, um, okay. 
again I know I went through that fast but you can always just uh, replay the video go back over it okay um, I've already done this one in the last lecture so now it's time to do this one so uh, how do we calculate the electric field of a very large very large just means we can approximate it as infinite what does that mean it means we can say that um, it's it's got planar symmetry it looks the same in all directions right all directions so um, again we'll look at what that means when we do the integral but they want us to find the electric field at points near the plane okay so it's got a surface charge density sig uh, sigma which is charge per unit area all right um, over here if we have this very very large sphere right positive charges uh, we draw a very small relative to the surface um, so the surface has lots of positive charges if we draw if it goes off in all directions that means that uh, the electric field has to be exactly perpendicular to the sheet right the surface how do, why is that the case well because if it extends in all directions any point that we say okay this little bit of charge generates an electric field in this way uh, there's we can always find because it extends in all directions a bit of charge somewhere else that generates an equal and opposite non-perpendicular component so because it's infinite then every non-perpendicular component of E gets cancelled by some other bit of the sheet um, to yield a perfectly perpendicular electric field why is that important because Gauss's law says the total flux through my let's just call it like a cylinder a very sort of squashed thin uh, cylinder short cylinder um, that again sort of sits the this side of the cylinder sits on this side of the sheet the other side of the cylinder sits on this side of the sheet um, so it's actually the our Gaussian cylinder is sort of uh, encapsulating or enclosing pi little r squared worth of the sheet worth of the surface area okay all right but we're not we don't even need to talk about that we don't even need to define an r because uh, Gauss's law says that the electric field, now that we've understood it is perpendicular to the surface, the um, flux integral just gives us E times 2A, right? There's a surface area this way that flux is going through and a surface area this way that flux is going through. So there are two end caps to my cylinder that are experiencing flux, two end caps of area A. The enclosed charge uh, is just the surface charge density charge per unit area times the area uh, of the Gaussian cylinder. Okay, so charge per unit area times area gives me enclosed charge. Uh, so I have an, a sigma A on the right divided by epsilon naught, E times 2A on the left. The electric field for this uh, infinite, very, very large sheet of charge is just surface charge density divided by 2 epsilon naught, which is something that we uh, found when we calculated the brute force way in chapter 21 we found that we're very very close to that sheet of charge we looked at it in terms of a disk but if we were very close to the disk it looks like a sheet uh, we get the same result okay um, so for a conductor very similar we could do the same thing draw a little uh, like in green imagine those little green boxes are Gaussian cylinders just like I drew um, but remember that there's no electric field inside a conductor so if we have a conducting volume again we can't have a <laughs> um, a surface that doesn't close the volume uh, conductors are volume objects so there's always a volume um, the bottom part of this green Gaussian surface lies inside the volume where the electric field is zero how do we know because if it weren't charges would move until it were um, by virtue of it being a con conductor and having an infinite sea of conduction electrons. So the, uh, the calculation works very, very much the same way as this calculation does, this calculation does, uh, except we only have one area, one area on the left-hand side of the flux integral because there is no electric field on the other side. So uh, that's where the, the factor of two goes. Instead of having a two on the left-hand side, there 
uh, there's only one area through which the electric field passes near the surface of a conductor. So uh, there's two ways to look at this. You could either see that the um, field inside the conductor is zero, so all of the flux goes through only one cap, like I just said, or you can say um, the a non so a conducting plane has a surface charge density on each side, giving it twice the charge density, the effective charge density. I don't really like that way. It doesn't really make a lot of sense to, you know, to talk about it that way. It's not really consistent. So definitely go with number one. Um, so we can, we can answer this question conceptually. This is a good test of your conceptual understanding of Gauss's law and how we've, uh, what we've done so far. So uh, we've got this sort of weirdly shaped conductor. It doesn't have to have any particular symmetry, but we've got a spherical cavity. And the cavity doesn't even have to have a spherical shape. It could just be any cavity. And we place a point charge positive little q inside the cavity. And then we place positive big Q total charge on the conductor. The question is, what can you say about the charges on the inner and outer surfaces of the conductor? Well, the starting point, if you've been paying attention, is the electric field inside the conductor is zero. Okay, again, it's a conductor, so charges can move around until the electric field is zero. Um, now, inside the cavity, right, we're, we know the electric field inside the cavity. We just do a little Gauss's law with a Gaussian surface inside the cavity. We know that the electric field inside the cavity is just k little q over r squared. Um, but if we draw this Gaussian surface that's, that encloses both the cavity and the inner surface of the conductor, uh, so in other words, it, that green circle lies at a slightly greater radius than the cavity itself, we say, okay, the electric field through that green Gaussian surface is zero because there's no electric field inside the conductor. So the left-hand side of Gauss's law yields zero, right? There's no flux through that green surface because there's no electric field because it lies inside the conductor. So if the left-hand side of the Gauss law is zero, the right-hand side must be zero. There must be no net charge uh, inside this green circle, this green dotted. It's actually, again, a cross-section of a Gaussian sphere, um, which means that exactly negative Q, if there's no net charge inside the green circle, exactly negative Q sits on the inner, inner surface of this cavity. Okay. Um, in order to ensure that the electric field inside the conductor is zero. Now, what does that mean about the uh, outer surface? Well, we know that positive Q has been deposited on the conductor, but uh, there's also, so that means the net charge on the conductor must be positive Q. Well, we know that negative, negative little Q is now sitting on the inner surface of this cavity so if I've got negative Q on the inner surface and the net charge on the conductor has to be a positive Q, I can draw this up or write this up uh, here. Okay, so um, the, the charge, let me just copy this up here a little bit. Very, very, uh, very crudely positive Q. Okay. Um, we want to know how much charge sits on the outer surface. We already know that negative Q sits there. We know that the total total charge is Q that sits on this conductor as a whole. So uh, the outer surface, if I've already got a negative Q on the inner surface, all available charge either sits on the inner surface or the outer surface, it's a conductor, uh, the outer surface must have little positive Q plus big Q. Okay, I'll zoom this in because I know it's, it's really hard to see that down there. Okay, so again, this whole, you know, whole thing has a total charge positive Q, but we know that negative Q sits on the inner surface because it's drawn there by this 
positive little q. So if the inner surface has a negative q, the outer surface has to have a total of big Q plus little q positive in order to write these two when, they, when you add them cancel to give you a total charge of positive Q. So just conceptually we know that with such a situation a conductor uh, that has a cavity within which there's a positive charge positive Q, okay, uh, we know that a total charge of big Q plus little Q sits on the outer surface of this conductor just by reasoning alone. So that's pretty important. Okay, so uh, that's the end of chapter 20, chapter 22. Uh, this last bit was is just an experimental bit about how you can observe this. Uh, you know that that'll come up in lab videos, which I still hope to to put up at some point. But the lecture has to come first, so uh, just hold on there. All right, folks, that does it for chapter 22. Uh, take a look out for the homeworks from chapter 22, and let me know if you have any questions.